Hey y'all, this is Kobe R. Rice and I'm back again for another, not weekly, apparently now quarterly update on this podcast. Welcome to the epic, fantastical journey of a black female sci-fi writer. I am Kobe R. Rice, novelist, game designer, dramaturg, theater maker, director, producer, etc., etc., and now boutique owner but we'll get to that in just a second as you guys can imagine because i've been away for so long things have just been so crazy in a good way mostly but there have been some challenges but so many things have happened i think the last update i gave you guys was for my birthday it was my second trimesterly roundup my second quarterly roundup excuse me on June 29th and so wow I mean now I'm recording this as of Sunday 8 46 a.m September 13th so 2020 so as you can imagine quite a few things quite a many things have passed since then But in any case, let's just jump right into it, shall we? So when I first, or rather last, broadcasted to you guys, I was reflecting a lot on the past 10 years of my life as a millennial, my past 10 years of my life as a person, as an artist, as a novelist, and I was very, very pleased with the progress that I had made in spite of the fact that my particular generation in 2008, 2009, when we were coming into the workforce, we got hit hard with the Great Recession. And now we're getting hit really hard with the COVID recession, so to speak. And so it's just like a been a really rough journey for not just myself, but like for many other people in my age group who have their dreams and their hopes and their wishes and all their desires that they want to make manifest in life. Yet and still, even though I've encountered all of those challenges just like everyone else. I have been really, really happy with my own personal progress um, because really honestly, even though I'm not as far along as I would like to be, the fact that I kept putting my foot in front of the other foot and moving forward, it still was able to get me many, many things and many, many accomplishments that I'm really proud of and happy about. So I'm not going to go into those, obviously. That's for the last podcast that I did. You can always feel free to check out Podcast 107, um, which is about the celebration of my birthday and all of that good, awesome stuff. I did want to come to you, though, with the Q3 Creative Achievements Roundup because, again, I've just been so busy. I've been away from the podcast, and I do really enjoy recording these podcasts. It's just when I'm trying to balance out creative priorities and because podcasts take a while to get together even if even mine is relatively um unedited and like kind of raw and rough but it still takes a lot of time to put the podcast together so even though that is the case here i um still have to take time out to do this oops i hit the mic sorry And sometimes when I'm trying to balance out my priorities, I need to choose other more immediate priorities over the podcast. But I'm back. And I just wanted to give you guys a really long and meaty update as to what's been going on. Um, I'm sure the first thing you would have noticed is, ta-da, I have opened up a fashion boutique, which is... (laughs) If you were listening to my last podcast and you were listening to the goals that I set in my last podcast, opening a fashion boutique was like nowhere sniffing around even close to being on that list of goals. (laughs) And I'll take you through that process as to how I got to that particular point. Um, And it's not as random or as out of the blue as you guys think, but we'll get to that. But yes, I did open a fashion boutique. We'll get to that in just a second. Let's go through the typical run-of-the-mill stuff first, okay? I just wanted to give you guys an update as to what's going on. As you guys know, I do work full-time as a theater teacher. And so um, in the time of COVID, obviously, there are certain things that uh, we have to deal with. And one of those major things as a teacher that I have to deal with 
is that we are now officially into virtual learning. And just preparing for that um, mentally, emotionally, and just physically to, and technologically has been a challenge, but I think that we've done very well with overcoming those challenges to provide the best education that we can to our students. So basically what we're doing at the moment is that we are opening virtually and we actually just finished our first week as of this past Friday. And we're gonna be open virtually for the first six weeks of the school year. And then we are going to, on October 19th, engage in a hybrid model, which means that half of the school is going to be allowed into the building two days out of the week, and the other half of the school is going to be allowed in the building the other two days out of the week, and we're going to take one day out of the week to do a massive cleaning so that um, we're not spreading germs and everything <clears throat> like that. The other thing that we're doing is that while half of the school is in the building for those two days, the other half of the school is expected to attend school virtually and vice versa. So every single scholar or student is gonna be getting four days of instruction from eight to four about, except two of those days, if they so choose, will be in the physical space, whereas the other two will be in their virtual space. And of course, this is subject to change. If COVID unfortunately does rear its ugly head in a major way, it hasn't really gone away. As you guys know, if you've been watching the news, it hasn't really gone away at all. We've been doing a great job here in New York and keeping the numbers down because Cuomo is not playing any games. However, if um, the COVID epidemic resurges in the fall, which is possible because we're gonna be dealing with, <clears throat> excuse me, COVID, and the flu season at the same time, then the schools are gonna shut back down and we're gonna go back fully virtual, which in that case, we'll just be going back to business as usual, which we already have a model for. So that has been um, a very interesting, but relatively straightforward to a certain degree process for us. As for how to manage an entire theater class in the virtual space, well, let's just say it's taking a lot of creativity and I am using a lot of different software solutions to help us enhance our virtual experience. So we're definitely going to be doing a lot of Flipgrid, which is like a little system that allows students to record themselves for a minute or two, doing performances, responding to questions, doing improv, things of that nature. Um, we're gonna be basically engaging in a lot of virtual VR, AR reality theater, which is gonna be a really fun experimental exploration of that area of theater, which right now is very fringe and relatively new, but this is a perfect opportunity to start expanding that particular area of study for my field. And um, we're gonna be doing a lot of film analysis, filmmaking, theater analysis, watching shows and talking about them, and um, just exposing the scholars to as much theater and film as possible. In particular, the theater and film that reflects their experience as black and brown youth. So we're gonna be doing a lot of that, and of course, a lot of play reading, a lot of play acting, and just a lot of study of the field from a historical, topical standpoint. So that's basically what's going on. Uh, I do have a pretty strong curriculum that I developed in emergency mode last year when we were in quarantine. And so of course, I'm gonna re-engage that curriculum that we studied. And I'm going to be adding onto that curriculum as needed with more interactive activities. So this is an opportunity for me to expand as a theater teacher and for my scholars to expand their already relatively limited knowledge and understanding of theater, being that there's these socioeconomic barriers to black and brown folk getting to the theater to begin with. So I have been having a great week in that regard, but where my homeschooling of my child is concerned, oh my gosh, it's more so that I have to work full time 
from home and be available for live classes and live teaching at the same time that she has to be available for her live classes and live learning. So when I don't have class and I don't have to broadcast to my students, I'm right there with my daughter making sure she's doing the work, she understands what's going on, she has my support, because sometimes she can lose confidence kind of easily. And um, that is definitely taxing in some in some ways but necessary the times where we run into issues are when I have to again talk to my students and be on for my students and she is essentially left to her own devices basically at the desk behind me doing what she has to do but I have to sort of lean on the teachers on her end and on her own personal focus in order to trust that they're going to get through the lesson together and as you can imagine her being five about to be six in less than a month, the focus is just not there yet. <laughs> At least not for a virtual space. In the physical space, she's golden. In the virtual space, there are way too many distractions. However, we did survive our first week together and every single day is getting better and better. So I'm really excited about that. And I think we're both starting to get into a flow. So this is just the reality, guys, of living in a world, I would say kind of like a pre-dystopian, peri-dystopian world where a pandemic has hit. You can't really go anywhere. You have to make all these changes to make life continue to work. And this is just sort of a snapshot as to how some of us are making it work. And I'm just really grateful to the school system that um, my daughter is in and the teachers that my daughter is learning for, are learning from is learning from, excuse me, this trimester because they are really busting their rumps to make sure our scholars and our kids get the best education possible, just like I'm busting my rump to make sure other parents' kids are getting the best education possible. And I'm trying to do my part. And I see us all trying to do our parts. So if you're struggling with similar situations where you're dealing with working full time from home and homeschooling your kid at the same time, or you are be struggling because you're between paychecks because your job was like based in the physical world, like bartending or hospitality or something like that, and you're struggling while you're also trying to homeschool your child, my heart goes out to you. I feel for you. I'm gonna keep you in my prayers and in my thoughts and just put good vibes out into the universe. It's, I know it's not much, but like as many of us, give, if we give as much positive energy as possible to those around us who are in similar situations, that energy, that desire, that drive will turn into good deeds and will turn into um, us helping each other. So um, just hang in there, guys. It's rough for all of us, more so to varying degrees for others of us, and we just have to give each other a lot of grace and kindness and love during this time. And hopefully it'll be over soon. Okay, so that was my little update for what's going on at my work right now. Um, on a personal note, uh, like, man, so much has happened and it's all been fantastic. So I had my first camping trip and it was incredible. I loved it. I... It, Y'all know I'm in like my mid 30s and not having had a camping trip was just killing my entire life. <laughs> and I learned so many things. I learned how to uh, build a campfire. I learned how to pack a back, back, packing backpack. <laughs> Say that three times twice, three times, three times twice, three times fast. Okay, I can't talk today, y'all. Um, I basically hiked probably like around 20 miles. Half of that was with like a 50 pound pack, which was not my intention. I deliberately packed light and I ended up getting saddled with other things from my colleagues that from so my, for my first camping trip, I was carrying a lot of weight and wow, was that a challenge? I was like, my body was on fire at the end of that camping trip, but I've learned a lot um, about packing even lighter for the future. Um, I ate my first s'mores and we saw really wonderful stars and there was like a full moon. It was like the weekend of July 4th. And um, I also pitched my first tent and survived my first night. Um, it was, I had like all the experiences rolled into one because it was beautiful weather during the camping trip mostly, but then there was a day of thunderstorms. 
So I also then ended up camping in the rain and had the very unfortunate experience because my tent was open when the rain came of rain pouring into like half of my tent, getting my entire bag wet and me having to essentially sleep in a wet camping bag in the cold, which was trash. That was the trash, the most trash part of the camping trip, I'll say, but it did put some hair on my chest, so to speak. And it absolutely gave me a very hard learning experience. Some hard lessons were, t- were taught to me during this time. Um, never, leave, never leave your camping tent door open ever. <laughs> not even for a minute. If you are not in your tent, your door is closed. Sometimes actually even if you are in your tent, your door should be like zipped closed. Um, yeah, because you never know when the weather is going to change and you don't know if you're going to be able to get to your tent in time to make sure it's protected from the rain. Generally, my tent was really on point and amazing. Like I, I, I had a really um, economical tent that worked very well and sleeps two people. So now I get to, in the future, take my daughter camping. When I feel more comfortable in my skills and more practiced, that's definitely going to happen. But um, it wasn't the tent's fault that it got wet. It was my fault. So we saw fireworks and um, we explored some really amazing ruins because we went to the Harriman State Park that is around my area here in New York. And yeah, the only thing that, and then we also, of course, cooked and I learned the value of packing a lot less food than you actually think you need (laughs) for a camping trip. But um, the only experience I didn't get to have was the chopping of wood, um, which I will hope to get next time. And we also went to the beach, which was really nice. So it was a really great trip. I lost three pounds (laughs) in that one weekend and I learned a whole lot. So that was fantastic. It was a major personal achievement for me in July. Um, And because I like to look forward, I started planning more trips for 2021, one of which is going to be a trip to Bali and another of which is going to be a trip to South Africa. It's going to be a screenwriting trip with some really amazing mentors in the Hollywood screenwriting industry. And so it's going to be a combination of like a screenwriting safari and also some one-on-one manuscript, not manuscript work, but script work, excuse me. And so that's going to be pretty amazing. And that's happening in September. And that's actually one of the reasons, just kind of giving you a, a hint slash spoiler, that's one of the reasons I started the boutique. But I'll get to that in just a second. All right. So I've also just been like taking care of myself more. You guys know on this channel that I am super into radical self-care and to make sure, I mean, really this started like hardcore in 2018 where I started really looking at my health, my, um, like my skincare, my like emotional and spiritual care and the journey continues. So, um, I actually have to a certain degree been able to lock down finally a, um, relatively, um, consistent, exercise and fitness schedule as like as and the reason why I've been able to do that is because I'm doing 10 to 15 minute hit workouts and I just leave it at that until I'm ready to expand and move up I decided that I wanted to try to just build a habit first of getting into exercise and then I would add on to that and keeping my exercise um, schedule to 10 minutes, keeping that block to 10 minutes makes it a lot easier to engage in some really helpful and useful exercising every single day without me looking at it with a sense of dread, without me feeling like, oh my God, I need a whole hour to do this. And then I just put it off for no reason. Um, So I have definitely been able to in the past month or so, like mid-August to mid-September, been able to lock down a relatively consistent exercise schedule. And so I let you guys know what the results of that are um, toward the new year. And I also am doing a little bit more shopping because that's what I need and that's what I want in my life. I'm trying to take care of my feminine spirit and um, rest more comfortably in my femininity. And doing that means feeling pretty, being pretty. So that's what I like to do. It's also a really nice counterbalance to my more rough and tumble 
quote unquote masculinized creative spirit where I'm always on the hustle, on the flow. I like to build businesses. I like to own businesses. The things that I write about are very dark and um, bloody and hardcore. And, you know, my whole tagline for the Books of Ezekiel series is alchemy and ass kicking, you know. So I like balancing out that more um, angled, badass, edgy side with like a softer, like, more feminine lifestyle because your fiction does not have to be your reality especially for my melanated black women out there who are often expected to be as hardcore on the outside as we are perceived to be on the inside and that is not necessarily what you have to do my ladies so having said that that's what I've been doing to take care of myself I'm going to keep taking care of myself as you can see I'm getting my nails done I got my pedicures on point. My skin is looking great. I just have to work on, you know, the shoulder area, but one one step at a time, right? Um, and of course, a part of me, I keep, I'm going to keep doing this throughout the podcast until I get to this point. A part of me taking care of my femininity and my, like my external and internal softness and beauty is to start this boutique (laughs) and not only did i start a boutique i also started building the foundation for a cosmetics and beauty store so yeah plot twist reveal your girl's also starting a a cosmetics line but we'll get to that in just a second i'm going to keep doing that to you guys until we get to it as for my creative um movement forward I did do quite a bit of plotting and world building for the Sons of Equitus. Let me get my words together. For the Sons of Exodus prequel series, which as you guys know, is not not the four book, but now a five book prequel series that is planned for the books of Ezekiel series. So this is basically Ezekiel's life before her ordeal with her main antagonist in the current books of Ezekiel series. It was, it's a backstory about how she got into her field. I'm trying not to reveal certain things for those of you who have not read my series. Read my series and then you'll know what I'm talking about. But um, this is basically how Ezekiel got started on her path. Um, and also we go into some other characters that I'm super excited about. Sons of Exodus is gritty, y'all. It's gritty so much to the point where I... Feel I have to put a very firm and solid trigger warning at the beginning of every single book. And as a matter of fact, book number three is entitled Trigger Warning. <laughs> um, excuse me, that's book number two, not book number three. So it's very gritty. It's very rough. And it's going to be a very enthralling experience, but in many ways sort of a harrowing experience, especially in book four, which... You know, I'm kind of afraid to even publish the damn thing, but it's it's this it's the story that's inside of me, so I have to. But I mentioned that I put an extra novel in there, and it's really because I needed to have it in there in order to make the series complete and for it to make sense dramaturgically in my mind. So here is the list of novel names in that series in order of appearance or what will be their appearance. Book number one of Sons of Exodus is called Of Silk and Steel. Book number two is called Trigger Warning. Book number three is called Sons of Exodus. Book number four is called Numbers Game. That's the rough book that y'all are going to be looking at me like I'm crazy. And then book number five is called Wolves, Ash, and Ember. And I feel very, very comfortable where that series is right now in terms of its plotting, in terms of character development, etc., etc., So that's pretty much going to be the structure of the series, and I am building up the plot of that series now. Um, I've also finished, I also completely finished the five or six character plot of the current novel that I'm writing, which is Fraternity, which is Books of Ezekiel number four. That's the fourth book in the current series. The plot is all done. It's looking fire. I finished it on July 31st, and every single character's plot has been worked out step by step by step, and now it's just about finishing the manuscript, which I've had a little bit of trouble with because I opened a fashion boutique, (laughs) 
which we'll get to in a second. Um, and then I also worked on some plot development for my main character, Ezekiel, for the next three books in the Books of Ezekiel series. So whenever I develop any part of this series, it automatically almost always carries over into the future books because I'm trying my best to make sure that the things that I set up in one book in the past are paid off in the next book or in the next book or in the next book. So one plot line, one plot twist, one plot hole is always going to be paid off down the line. And the easiest way to pay that off down the line is to plan that book, that future book out while I'm also planning the past book out, right? To make things more cohesive. So in terms of novel writing, I have been working on Fraternity, which is book number four, Hollow Point, which is book number five, and The Iron Maiden, which is book number seven. The Haunt, book number six, has taken on a slightly, slightly different life of its own in a good way. And I haven't really worked on the plot actively or written that book actively, but in my mind, there are certain things that are falling into place. So um, we're just going to let that keep happening. In terms of actual words on the page, I have absolutely positively lagged on that. July was all about getting the plot hammered out. And then August, as I mentioned before, and as I'll keep mentioning, was all about me establishing this fashion boutique and this cosmetics line. So I was very focused on that entire endeavor throughout the entirety of August. And I got some words written here and there, but I haven't really, I didn't really jump back into the actual manuscript writing of it. And even in September, I'm writing more, but I'm still struggling with creating something consistent. My goal is though to have that book finished by finished and published and out to you guys by the end of the year, at the very least, because I need to have at least one book published under my name this year. I cannot go a whole year without having published a book. So um, for The Bohemian Badass, which is my online creative university, which is constantly, you know, on the back burner for whatever reason, I did work on my Plot Like a Badass course that I'll be releasing at The Bohemian Badass. And then I also conceptualized the a course called 30 Day Boutique for the, for the Bohemian Badass because I literally was able to set up and launch my boutique in about 30 days. And so that particular course, I'm not really working on it now. I'm just outlining it and conceptualizing it is based specifically on the steps that I went through in order to establish my boutique in 30 days. And I mean the LLC, the domain name, the brand, the colors, the font, building the website, building, building the web store, getting a vendor list together, getting inventory, doing all of those things. I did all of that in 30 days. I took a break and then I launched my store this past Monday on Labor Day. So um, this 30 day boutique course is going to help those of you who are interested in launching your own, your own online boutiques. It's gonna help you guys to do that. So um, yeah, basically anything that I do gets turned into a course <laughs> if I'm successful at it. And so that's, on, that's another course that I have on the docket right now. Okay, before I get into the boutique, one last thing. I did engage very heavily in some creative uni in this past quarter. So I studied up for a hard relaunch of the marketing and branding side of the entire Rebel Ragdoll Fempire. That includes Rebel Ragdoll Press, which handles my books. I am gearing up to start the marketing arm of Rebel Ragdoll Productions, which is the film and TV arm of my Fempire in progress. I'm also uh, gearing up to do more marketing and branding for The Bohemian Badass. And um, of course, I'm getting into marketing and branding for the boutique and the cosmetic line that I am opening and debuting. And this is really important even for those brands who have yet to be established because it takes a while to build a brand and to build an audience. And what I've learned in the past year, I would say probably year, maybe two years of taking time off of the marketing end of things, you should still always be marketing. This is something that I knew in the back of my mind. But at the same time, y'all, I did need a break from the 
crazy rat race of book marketing, of blogging, of newsletter exchanges, especially after my what was a very harrowing experience for me being a part of a multi-author box set last year, last spring that went belly up for me. They were successful and I'm happy for those authors who were a part of that, but that endeavor went belly up for me in terms of how I was treated when I had to make certain decisions for myself to leave the box set um, and how my reputation was unfortunately dragged through the mud, which I didn't feel comfortable about in the moment talking about because these individuals are very litigious But um, now that I have receipts and screenshots, you guys will be getting a look into what I call the dark side of collaboration. Not now. We're going to keep it positive. I'll introduce you guys to that on the anniversary that I left the box set in 2021. So as of, I believe it was maybe April, mid-April 2021 that I left that box set, I will do that podcast on that two-year anniversary of that day, okay? So just wait for that. But I say all this to say that because of that experience and because I wanted to focus more on content creation and rebuilding myself and my love for, excuse me, my field, I stepped back from marketing. I stepped back from collaborating with authors and other people. And now I want to sort of get more into that. Um, very slowly and surely just gearing everything up and becoming a marketing maven and just relearning the marketing strategy for all of the industries that my empire is trying to grow in. So this is an opportunity for me through Creative Uni to come in with what I call virgin brain, virgin mind, and essentially start from scratch. And I do have an audience of almost 11,000 readers, which is great. And about 20% of them do open and read my emails, which is great. But um, I want to build a stronger, more engaged, and um, just more fruitful and constructive relationship with every single one of my customers, every single one of my readers, my community members. I want this to be a tight, vibrant, just voracious community of fiction lovers, film lovers, fashion lovers. Okay, so that's what I'm aiming for, and I have a lot of ideas as to how I'm going to start doing that, but I started just a slow relaunch and re-warming, warming up of, does that even make any sense, but warming up of those marketing strategies that I'll be learning and actually engaging in and executing from here on out. No more breaks in the marketing, basically. Sorry for the plane outside. Life is happening, thankfully. Um, I also watched, okay, this is going to be kind of funny and silly, but like I also watched um, Julia Child's The French Chef PBS series because I just wanted to delve back into my cooking. I do, I really enjoy cooking. I find it a very calming, relaxing, meditative, meditative experience. It also helps me to reconnect with a womanly art. I don't, And don't take this the wrong way for those of you who are women who are like, oh my gosh, that's so non-progressive what she just said. Um, Some of the best chefs in the world are men. But for me, in terms of engaging in like more domestic arts, I, I really love it. I'm a cancer, you know what I'm saying? We're home, we're the crabs, we're the ones who are about the home and hearth and home, heart and hearth. And... Cooking has been a huge part of my personality, a part of my identity that was unfortunately stolen from me. And I, 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 I do not say that dramatically. I say that very realistically. Stolen from me between um, basically 2014 and you know 2017 because of a very toxic situation that I was a part of wherein everything that I cooked and everything that I did was criticized taken away, threatened, just this toxic miasma was placed over my deep, deep, deep love of cooking. And for a while, I not only lost the desire to cook, but I lost my talent and my skills because I was a really great cook prior to this situation, um, to this toxic situation. But now that I am back in New York, 
I and I've recently had a major personal accomplishment, FYI, wherein now I know I can stay in New York because that was up in the air for a while. Um, I am firmly here and I feel more in charge and more, um, I feel more ownership over that aspect of life such that like my spirit is open and freed and I am getting back into the game and I still got it y'all. So I still got it and I'm going to keep developing it over time. And I'm looking forward to getting a lot of really wonderful cooking and baking supplies and just living on that level. And it also kind of also really helps me, again, no offense to anybody else who's listening to this, but it helps me to reconnect to my feminine side and my feminine divine and to the domestic womanly art of just hosting and cooking and like feeding people and nurturing people is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, I'm a little bit of a traditionalist and I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with that. I hope that you guys are comfortable with that because as you know, on my other side, I tend to be very edgy and much more like go get them, run things, vampire building empress. But when it comes to my house and my home, I tend to be pretty traditional where that's concerned. So I'm reconnecting with that and it's really exciting. Um, I also definitely jumped back into refreshing my knowledge of filmmaking, directing, producing, and screenwriting by jumping back into Dove Simmons' Web Film School, which I find, I love that man. <laughs> I love that man and his knowledge and also his energy. Um, he just gives such a really amazing, no-nonsense approach to filmmaking that makes me feel empowered to go and be a director. And so whenever I need a boost, also, and also like, an educational reminder of what to do specifically, I'll jump back into his web film school. He has one on YouTube that's like each video, he has about maybe 70 videos. Each video is about three to five minutes long That I, and I've downloaded all of those videos and put them on my, um, my phone. And then I also invested in his larger, more expensive web film school. That's a 16 hour film school with like a 500 page workbook. And so whenever I need um, a boost or a reminder of what I'm here to do, I listen to Dove Simmons and I'm back on track. So I've been doing that. And then, of course, I'm going to mention this again, but this time we're going to talk about it. I listen to a bunch of courses and videos and podcasts and books and read books on how to open my own boutique. I took notes. I followed instructions. And in 30 days, I had a gorgeous, gorgeous boutique. It is called Rebel Ragdoll Boutique, and I'm really, really excited for it. So now we get to talk about it because we are finally at that point in the episode. Let's see. I'm going to get the timestamp. So 3750. Let's talk about Rebel Ragdoll Boutique, y'all. So the way that I even conceptualized this actually started back in 2014 when if you look at my Instagram and scroll down, Colby R. Rice on Instagram.com, you'll scroll all the way down and you'll find that I have maybe three or four pictures of like um, a racerback t-shirt or racerback blouse. I have some pictures of like bikini bottoms and then I have like some sweatpants. And each one of these pictures has the Rebel Ragdoll logo on it. Because in 2014, when I was still conceptualizing my vampire, I thought to myself that I want to create a brand, a name, and a mission, and a vibe that can extend not only to the books that I write, but also to the films that I make, to the games that I develop, and also to hot merch, merch and um, gear. We're gonna wait for the plane because it's killing my thunder here. Hold on. <clears throat> All right, we hear you, we hear you. Okay, now that the plane's gone, let's continue. I wanted a brand and a name that could extend to any sort of media that was transmedia, that can be licensed, that can be labeled, that can be packaged, that could be rented, that could be bought, although I'm never selling my brand ever. You could borrow it. You can rent it more specifically, but you're never going to be able to buy it. It's mine. It's going to stay my legacy 
and in my family forever in perpetuity. However, Rebel Ragdoll, in my mind at that time, I was like, this could be a really fantastic women-identified publishing press or women-identified film production house or a woman-identified fashion brand and name brand and merch brand and motorcycle brand. I mean, there are so many things that you can do with that name, with that brand, as long as you keep the brand on point and you keep it tight and you keep your mission statement and what you do with your brand very cohesive. So I started actually reaching out and dabbling in the world of fashion in 2014 by playing around with certain print-on-demand companies. That one, I believe, was called... um, I don't know, Casual Girl or something like that. I'll put the link to them below. They're still a pretty cool company to work with, but I've found better since. Um, So I was looking at companies that would take your brand, your logo, your design, and print them on, you know, blank t-shirts or blank pants or whatever so that, like, anybody who was super into Rebel Ragdoll like that could go and buy a sweatshirt or a blouse or sweatpants or whatever. At the time though, I didn't have the knowledge of the field and I also really didn't have as many resources at that time in order to make this fashion brand what it needed to be. This was almost a decade ago, honestly. This was six years, now going on almost seven years ago that I looked into this. Since then, however, technology has opened up, new manufacturers have opened up, the print-on-demand market has definitely exploded and opened up, and so I'm basically returning back to this now in 2020 with a lot more resources and a lot more, a, a deeper knowledge, so to speak, as to how to make this successful. I was also really young in the game. I had just published two books the year before, like the December before, and I was, you know, just kind of wandering through the 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 pond, the lake, the the magical forest of my creativity. And I didn't really have as much direction, but now I know exactly what it is I want to do. And now being that time has passed, I have the resources. Just as a side note, this is why it's important to work on your ideas even if there is nothing out there to support your idea, because when that technology becomes available, you can be one of the first ones in line to avail yourself of that technology. It's sort of like, I I call that taking the Hemingway approach, right? Ernest Hemingway got no props, no accolades, no recognition during his life. And his life was actually pretty crappy, and so was his death, honestly. He he died thinking that he was a failure because nobody was reading his books, nobody cared about his work. And I'm sure that was a huge factor in his depression. But he still kept writing, he still kept doing his thing. And now, after his death, he is one of the most widely read novelists and writers in the world. I don't know a single high school that has not read or forced their students to read a Hemingway book, right? So this was a man who was tortured, in my opinion, emotionally tortured, feeling emotionally tortured, in my opinion, because he could not find a place in the world in which he was living at the time. The world was not ready for him at the time. But his work lived on. His He has now achieved immortality through his work, and he might never know how impactful his work is nowadays, But every single child in every single classroom knows who Ernest Hemingway is. And that was not the case when he was alive because the world was just not ready for him. So I say all of that to say, keep writing, keep creating, keep doing your thing, keep producing, keep publishing, keep filmmaking, whatever it is that you're interested in and that you love to do, that you are called to do by the universe, do it. Because you're not really being called to be famous. You're being called to live in your purpose so that you can make an impact on the world, whether now or 100 or 300 years in the future. The universe knows what it's doing. It's very intelligent. So you have to make sure that you are making your impact while you are here so that whatever you create 
in the here and now can continue to benefit and evolve the world long after you're gone. So I'm coming back down from that lofty soapbox I just climbed up onto to get back to the point, which is that I started this in 2014 and I didn't have the means to produce any of this until now. So now I'm coming out full force and currently I have 133 designed products in the pipeline to re- to release for the boutique. So I have no pro I have no process. I have no shortage, excuse me, of product. It's really now about just making sure I connect the consumer with the product, which is why I'm getting back into marketing. That's one of the reasons why I started the boutique. The other is that I've always just wanted to do it. I've always been into fashion. I love fashion. I love shopping. Um, and that's always just been the case. And it's just very fun to shop for fashion for my store. <laughs> but the other major reason why I'm getting into it Um, because I mentioned earlier that I was planning a trip to Bali and to South Africa, is that I'm looking at my streams of income and I do want to continue to diversify my streams of income and I want to build and multiply my money. And I thought to myself, I want to raise about 10 Gs specifically so I can take trips to these two countries. Now, I can go to both of these countries for half of that. I can go to both of these countries, but I wanted these trips to be lavish, like legit first class, five-star hotel level trips because I haven't done that yet. I've done the rough and tumble backpacking, which has been wonderful, but now I'm older, I'm more elegant, I'm more refined. I want to have a taste of that high life, but who just has 10 grand just hanging around for that reason? I mean, some people do, and I want to get there to where I have that money. But right now, it's not looking like that. So I said, what is the most, um, what is the easiest, lowest cost, high yield, low investment way to get this money that I need to get? And all of a sudden, that 2014 brain clicked on and was like, don't you have a fashion boutique waiting in the wings to be opened? And my response to that was, yes, Yes, I do. So that's what I did. I took basically Rebel Ragdoll Boutique out of the closet, dusted it off, upgraded it, gussied it up, and now here we are. So I spent the majority of August building the website, building the web store, honing the brand. I'm still trying to actually now weave in my overall mission statement into a few taglines that I can use on my social media outlets. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to be testing out multiple marketing taglines. So just be patient with me. But I worked on that as well. I also worked on product development. Where basically I decided what it was that I wanted to sell in my fashion store. I decided what kind of fashion store I wanted to be, what my target audience was, and then I stocked my store with designs and things that I felt would appeal to my target market. So my target market right now are girls aged 18 to 35. And basically it's for women and girls who are super edgy, badass, um, take control of their life, just sultry and sexy but at the same time like to step out being very feminine resting in their femininity having clothes including athletic lines that represent the boldness of who they are but also like the sexy soft um, silhouette of the feminine figure so if you look at rebelragdollboutique.com or rebelragdollfashion.com you'll see that I have debuted our first line of clothes, basically, and it's an athletic line that is branded specifically with my company brands. So the Bohemian Badass, which has a really sexy, amazing logo, that has become an entire branded line of athletic gear. And there are more pieces available than what you can see on the website, but I'm rolling those out very slowly. Rebel Ragdoll Press, which has the really awesome, crazy looking, dystopian, gas mask wearing Afro chick on it. 
that has also become a line of its own athletic gear. So I'm selling now leggings, sports bras, duffel bags, weekender bags, and sneakers. That's how I've debuted out here. A um, uh, very sort of straight to the point, head to toe athletic line. Oh, and I'm also selling face masks as well. Face masks and neck gaiters I'm selling. So for those of you who want to step out in style in a fully fledged head to toe rebel rag doll or bohemian badass athletic style, like that is now available for you. And there are gonna be more styles that are released in the future for those of you who want like a different sort of look. You don't wanna obviously be recreating the same style that everybody else is wearing, obviously, but more pieces will be available in the future. At the same time, I am also looking, not even looking into, I have looked into and purchased my first fashions, basically. I've become a fashion buyer because as a fashion boutique owner, once you get your seller's permit and your LLC together, you become a fashion buyer, which means that you decide on what collections you want in your store, what pieces, what dresses, what pants, what outfits, and then you go shopping on wholesaler sites, you go to trade shows, and you pick out the pieces that best represent the style, the mission, and the brand of your store. So in addition to having a specific Rebel Ragdoll brand that I'm pushing on my store, I also have a line of, what do you call them, matching sets and coordinated sets coming that are not that don't have the Rebel Ragdoll logo on it, but are Rebel Ragdoll pieces. So we have rompers coming, we have coordinated sets coming, we have really sexy, cute blouses coming. Oh my gosh, they're so sexy. We also have what else is coming? Oh, some really awesome sunglasses and earrings coming. So it's a fully fledged boutique, not just a merch boutique where you're buying stuff that specifically reps Rebel Ragdoll's logo because that's a merch line and you can be into that. But some of us just want to buy cute clothes, but that's available. But we also have an actual fashion line coming, collections coming that we'll have our care labels in the clothes, but just look like cute outfits. So I'm really excited about that. At current though, what we have available, like I said, are the neck gaiters, face masks, um, the leggings, the bags, the sneakers. And we also have, in addition to the sports bras, we have crop hoodies and crop sweatshirts, which I really like actually. I expect those to fly off the shelves. Um, let's see, what else? So that's my boutique. I'm super excited about it. If you want to know more about my process, I'll be putting together soon a 30-day step-by-step process, basically taking you through what I did and also teaching you how to do it if you want to open a fashion boutique. Um, if you're wondering how I'm getting my clothes manufactured through POD, which is print-on-demand manufacturers, we're going to talk about that. For the pieces that are not print-on-demand, that don't have my Lego, Lego, my logo all over them, for the, getting those kinds of pieces, I will teach you how to find vendors and wholesalers. We're going to go through all of that, so just stay tuned on that. I also made sure to establish my social media and marketing outlets. So, you know, again, I'm getting into the marketing aspect of things. And we launched on Labor Day. And just letting you guys know, our launch for this entire month is basically coming out in style with a $200 shopping spree giveaway. So if you want to join our mailing list for a chance to win a $200 shopping spree, please do so. The link is below and you can always feel free to sign up and share the giveaway for a chance to win even more entries, which will up your chances of being a winner. There are three prizes, a $200 giveaway, for your shopping spree, a $50 shopping spree, and a $25 shopping spree at the boutique of your choice. And of course, all entrants in my giveaway are gonna get a prize. You guys know, maybe from 2017, if you remember back that far, that I never have a giveaway that does not make everybody a winner. <laughs> I'm one of those schmaltzy, I guess, uber liberal people that, that 
are hated by the bootstrappers out here who want everybody to who wants everybody to win. That's what I want because that makes us feel good, right? Um, so if you enter, even if you don't win one of the three grand prizes, you will win an entrance prize. So it doesn't matter um, if you win, you get a prize anyway. So please enter as soon as you can and help us celebrate our grand opening with our grand opening giveaway. Okay. So yeah, I am working on expanding the boutique, getting the boutique out there, making sure I'm doing the marketing things that I need and building the brand that I need and doing the content marketing that I need for my boutique going forward. Finally, I'm going to end with a lovely introduction to Rebel Ragdoll Beauty, which is the cosmetics line that I am starting. I thankfully and excitingly have found specific vendors that I'm going to be working with to develop my own cosmetics line. And once I've done that successfully, of course, a 30-day series on that will be forthcoming. But that's been pretty exciting. I designed my website already. And so that's exciting. It's rebelragdollbeauty.com if you want to check it out. I've also um, set up the, the web store, even though it's not open yet. It's set up behind the scenes. And I've created its social media outlets. And I've also done a lot, a lot of research and sampling. So that has been a very extensive process. And it's very important when you're opening a cosmetics line because you want to make sure that the products are high quality, that they are the way that they are promised. So having said that, I was able to tamp down a what was it, three or four vendors with whom I'll be working to create a line of lip stuff. I'm going to be very vague on what I'm going to be doing of lip care and um, eye care and lip glam and eye glam, let's put it that way. And I'm really, really excited. I'm loving the products that are coming in the mail that I'm sampling, and so that will be coming very soon. I'm not gonna be debuting Rebel Ragdoll Beauty until 2021, so um, stay tuned for that. But I absolutely will be marketing and blogging and content marketing between now and then because I wanna make sure I have some kind of audience before I launch. I also will be engaging in some soap making for Rebel Ragdoll Beauty in terms of getting um, a skincare line going. And also, again, a lot of this for me is about taking care of my own femininity as well. Like there are certain things that I want to do better for myself, which force me to then explore deeper avenues of skincare, of looking at natural ways to take care of and improve your skin, brighten your skin, um, make your skin sheenier or less oily or what have you. I actually happen to really love my skin, um, but I want to make sure that we all love our skin. And so I am definitely looking into creating a soap line specifically for um, the face and for the body and making sure like we can even out skin tone, keep skin healthy, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we, me and my daughter did make our first soaps together a couple of weekends ago, and it was really fantastic. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, and guys, that's really basically it. I mean, I'm going to end this just by saying that I have become much more activated this year to make sure that my Rebel Ragdoll Vampire in Progress continues to be in progress and continues to grow, continues to evolve. And I want to make sure that I am addressing all aspects of all my businesses to make sure that 10 or 20 years down the line, there is something that I can leave behind and something that I can look at and feel pride in, in what I've built. So um, expect to hear more from all aspects of the current Fempire. That includes the Rebel Ragdoll Press, Rebel Ragdoll Productions, The Bohemian Badass, now Rebel Ragdoll Boutique, and eventually in 2021, Rebel Ragdoll Beauty, okay? Chick Rogue Studios as game development is very much still in play, but that's a huge mega endeavor on its own that requires an entire team. And so I want to make sure I'm ready to launch that and ready to give my energy to that. And that won't be for like another couple of years, but it's still in play. So for those of you who have been patient for the game development aspect of all of this, Thank you, and please keep being patient for me while I get myself together, because right now it is sort of a crazy one-woman show, 
and eventually I do want to make this not a one one woman show but we'll get to that I am considering doing a hiring a virtual assistant however because I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely need some help with the marketing aspect so we'll see what happens with that in any case y'all I've been blabbing for over an hour now almost an hour I'm gonna go I'm exhausted I'm gonna get some coffee and live my best life and just take it easy on this Sunday before work starts up on Monday. Thank you so much for joining me again for this crazy Q3 Creative Achievements Roundup. Thank you as always for your continued support and love and just amazing presence on my channel, on my podcast, um, in my inbox, on my newsletter team, on my ARC team. All of you are coming from different places and I just really appreciate you and I am thankful for the community that, that I have, no matter how big, no matter how small. So having said that, guys, keep it indie, keep creating, stay badass, and I will talk to you guys as soon as I can. I wish I could say next week, but at this point, y'all know that I'm crazy busy with stuff. But as soon as I can, I will be back to hang out with y'all, okay? Bye.